like that apo yeah, okay yes <laughs> brilliant you feel okay. fantastic like that <laughs> dr abram <laughs> go to sir <laughs> <laughs> I've been on this call so many of them. Mbaka <laughs> <laughs> you have that favorite spot where you just go to and you know this will work. <laughs> yeah. No, so that uh, I set it up a bit uh, in the home office to make sure that because uh, I'm always in this call so let's just like Yeah. Great. But I was told it's going to be uh broadcasted live, right? Yes, on YouTube, Facebook, will be live then and there'll be live conversations as well. Okay. So there'll be questions questions might come from there we'll pose some of them to you. So the session is going to last between 3 to 5 p.m. I'll give you all a chance for opening remarks just to give an overview of what you think in terms of the economic interventions that the government has tried to put in place. Are they yeah. enough? Mm-hmm. Are they not enough? Where do you see the gaps and what should have been done? So I was telling uh, Dr. Ari earlier on, uh, Ms. Karen, that what I like to do is structure the conversations in such a way that we are not just lamenting. So we give mm-hmm. the outline, this is the situation, this is what's happening right now, this is what should have been done, so that we're also offering solutions. So I'll okay. give you a chance to just give the opening remarks and then we'll get into now the nitty gritties. Okay. Sure. Yeah. That's okay. Frank, we're good to go. Okay. We're ready live. Shall we start now that we are all here? Okay. All right. Great. I want to thank you for making this noon my name is Trevor Mbija and we're just going to have this conversation on the economic stimulus package a hit or a miss on cushioning Kenyans from the social and economic challenges of covid-19 we are live on youtube live on facebook we welcome all your views as well if you're tuning in online use hashtag state of the economy k and you know myself directly at Trevor Mbija or at CMD Kenya we'll pose some of your questions to the panelists who we have with us this afternoon most important we'd also like to hear from you in terms of what you think whether this interventions have been enough or more needs to be done this is coming at a time when the government itself says that there's more than 172 billion shillings intervention that has happened over the last day that covid-19 has been ravaging the country I want to introduce our guest really fast joining us today is Dr Abram Rugo is a Kenya country manager international budget partnership thank you so much for making time miss karen rono bet is also here she's the policy officer global partnerships for sustainable development data and miss linet nyangweso an economist research analyst and national at the national treasury is also with us thank you so much for making time honorable isaac moura who is a senator will join us later on and also honorable sabina shege chairperson health committee at the national assembly will be joining us in just a bit they've just had to rush to parliament and then they'll join this discussion as well we'll ask them the role of the legislature in ensuring that some of these interventions that have been put in place by the government reach the actual people who are targeted by those same interventions but first before any further ado i'd like to also welcome franklin kwanja the executive director center for multi party democracy to make his opening remarks and welcoming remarks as well frank Thank you Trevor and uh, welcome participants uh, to this uh, very exciting uh, discussion that we had this afternoon uh, definitely exciting because we have a very good mix of uh, panelists drawn from the private sector the public sector and also in academia to look into this very critical topic at a very uh, critical time um in our country of course we will also be joined by members of parliament as Trevor you've said uh, from both uh, the senate and the national assembly that are leading uh, critical committees uh, participants will be aware that uh, uh, honorable sabina shege is the chair of the health committee in the national assembly and the health committee uh, has been very critical in uh, discussing parliament's response and generally informing uh, the public policy around uh, 
the, the interventions on COVID, and also Senator Maura, who's the acting chair of the Budget and Finance Committee in the Senate. And you realize that a lot of money also goes to devolved uh, systems and therefore uh, health also being a devolved functions will be bringing in very insightful uh, details and conversation into this. We'll be looking forward for them joining us uh, and a really a critical conversation. Um, secondly, we have apologies uh, from our chair, Senator Abshiro Halake. You all understand that the kind of business that is on the floor of our Senate uh, this afternoon. I'm not going into de the details, uh, but he's a critical player in the Senate and uh, asked that I relay these apologies to fellow panelists and the participants. Uh, but if in case she gets a, a window of opportunity from a heavy um, uh, you know, duty on the floor of the house, and then she'll be able to join us, but please receive her apologies. I would want to quickly state that the COVID-19 pandemic is far more than a health crisis. It's a fact that we know that it is affecting societies and economies at their core. The impact is varying uh, from country to country, from family to family, from region to region, uh, urban to rural areas. And it will be most important that we look at how this is going to likely affect um, the, the economy of the country. Uh, and of course, when you talk about economy, uh, you're looking at the poverty, the inequalities uh, that will come with these uh, challenges uh, arising from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And, and therefore, it behooves us as a multi-party uh, democratic uh, dialogue uh, platform to convene such uh, multi-sectoral engagements and not just uh, discuss these propositions that are coming from the government and, and also, uh, you know, what the role of uh, the oversight, uh, you know, uh, people are doing, but also helping the public to understand what are the details of, of these propositions that the government is putting across? Uh, what is the opinion of the experts like you? So it's really a conversation to help each other, uh, to learn from each other and see how do we work together to ensure that we are all in a position to respond and be able to support, especially the fundamental, uh, the, 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 the vulnerable communities uh, that re require the necessary support uh, to be able to go through this difficult time. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abraham Rugo, uh, Ms. Karen uh, Bett and uh, Ms. Lina Tinyangweso for joining us at the beginning. And we look forward to having the next two panelists also joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, participants, uh, we look forward to engaging with you and we'll give you an opportunity uh, to send in your questions and we'll purpose to have uh, the questions uh, sufficiently responded to. Over to you, Trevor, and uh, wish you all a very uh, good conversation. Well, thank you so much, Frank. Very well said there. We'll give you a chance to ask all the questions you may have because essentially this is a conversation around the issue of budgets and whether it is a hit or a miss. Ms. Karen, I'll start with you. Having seen what has happened, the budget is laid out there. The government says the, the intervention that they've done is about 172 billion shillings, the most recent being the eight-point economic stimulus program, which is worth about 53.7 billion shillings. As it stands, from where you look at it, was this budget appropriate to deal with the situation that we're dealing with now, which is COVID-19? Thanks, uh, thanks, Trevor. And um, I'm really glad to be joining this conversation at a very timely moment. Um, just to answer your question very quickly, um, I'd like to sort of share what I feel like challenges, but also some of the things I see are going well in the economy when you think about the budget, when you think about the economic stimulus, and of course the situation we're in now uh, being a COVID, uh, COVID time. I think um, obviously COVID-19 has brought to the fore the challenges we face, uh, one as a developing country. Uh, Kenya is ranked a low and middle income country, and I think the, the way we're responding, or even how the pandemic is affecting us, really brings to the fore the challenges that developing countries uh, face. But also, it's it's been a chance to test our resilience as a country. Uh, how future ready are we as a country? And I think um, I could look at this in both ways, positive and negative. I think on uh, starting with the positive, which is always good, is um, I think we've been we've tested ourselves as a proactive country. I mean, seeing that the government is actually trying to put people first uh, by actually taking a risk and slowing down the economy just to be conscious of people's lives and people's health and making sure that we don't lose more people to the pandemic. And I think I've also seen a very committed health workforce in trying to um, 
use the resources that they have um, limited as they may be to just uh, support and uh, strengthen or cushion uh, people. And actually the other uh, positive before I move into the things which I think are challenges are, um, it's been easy to kick in social protection and cash transfers because we have, we're reaping the benefits of building these systems uh, earlier on. So uh, the country was able to, you know, um, repurpose uh, resources, uh, distribute cash, uh, uh, and uh, having registers uh, for these people who benefit from uh, the cash transfers. So I think this has been a true test of um, how, how quickly can we kick in systems uh, when in need. But over, of course, thinking about the challenges, I think what the pandemic has taught us, and um, I see this in the economic stimulus package and, and also the budget allocations, is that we just can't leave anyone behind. Um, while we have private systems that are um, sort of living and existing efficiently, we have public systems which need to catch up. And in a pandemic, we just can't leave public systems. And when I look at, I look at this from the public health system, but also the public education system, schools can't reopen if the pr public primary schools and public secondary schools are just not ready. If they don't have the digital tools, they don't have the number of teachers that are required, the right amount of desks and classrooms. So it is just impossible to leave other people behind. And I think uh, lastly, um, second to last actually is unemployment. And this is sort of covered in the economic stimulus packages it's becoming real by the day. People are losing jobs by the minute. And I think the more we realize this, the more we think about how, I do, how our economic stimulus packages and our budgets are actually responsive on a daily basis to people who are getting out of employment, the sooner we'll be, we'll be able to cushion people. And last but not least, uh, Trevor, before I, I let my uh, other speakers uh, talk is about the systems also that we have as data systems. I think the COVID uh, pandemic has tested our systems. It's no longer um, expected that we rely on a survey which takes five years or a census which takes 10 years to have data about people. I think government needs data and it's been actually giving out data on um, COVID daily. So we need, how do we make sure that our systems are future ready? How do we ensure that what we've started does not stop after the pandemic. Does the budget help us to do this? In some ways it does, in some ways I feel it doesn't. Thank you. <laughs> All right, that's a good way to leave it. Lynette, what are your thoughts on the budget? Knowing so our situation of the economic situation right now, does it address the issues that we need as a country right now? Thank you, Trevor, for that. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to appreciate the effort that actually the national Treasury uh, has put in place in terms of coming up with this uh, economic stimulus that is actually addressing some of the issues that are being experienced with the various uh, people in the society in terms of uh, lack of employment, lack of uh, uh, challenges in terms of having enough money to buy even basic needs, enough money to even have money for transport, uh, accessing healthcare and all that. I actually uh, I agree with the, and I appreciate that the government has, these measures that the government has put in place, for example, they have been able to allocate some of the resources to create uh, employment for, uh, for, one, uh, for local money in terms of uh, renovating the infrastructure. This is not only creating employment opportunity, but it also, even if it's, uh, my, my biggest challenge with this is, even though it is in the short, it's a short term income generating activity, but at least this income that they can get from uh, these activities from re repairing the roads can enable them to get, for example, seed money to do uh, investments in other personal, uh, personal uh, achievements. And also, uh, with regards to the soft loans that they want to give to hotels, I do agree that hotels have been really challenged in terms of uh, generating income to pay their staff and also buying the, the necessary food that they need to prepare for the various people who are coming to work or in different vicinities. But these loans, these soft loans that the government has been able to allocate from the budget will be able to at least, at least propel these hotels to be able to at least to come back at least to a place of normalcy. That is what I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Dr. Abram, what are your thoughts on the budget so far? Um, and I see there's a bit of complaints from the people who have tuned in that you should project your voices slightly louder. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Sure. Brad. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, Trevor. So, uh, I mean, I've taken quite a bit of time to review and look at the budget. Um, and, 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 and to say that, uh, uh, first of all, it's a very ambitious budget. Uh, because a budget is not so much what you plan to spend on, that's important, but it's also equally important uh, where the money will come from. Uh, so, so on one hand, uh, you have about 2.79 trillion that is supposed to be spent on, uh, while on the other hand, uh, you only are assured of a, of a figure of about 1.8 or oh, there are about 1.87 trillion. So, so then you're left with a gap of almost 900 billion. Uh, and when you look at the plan for expenditure, uh, uh, let's start with uh, what is of, of interest right now, the economic stimulus program. Uh, the entirety of that program is 56.6 billion. Uh, so basically you're saying that uh, you're gonna be spending 2.79 uh, a billion, I mean trillion uh, in the economy, but for an economy that is already crumbling, you're only putting 56.6 billion uh, as a mechanism to try and, 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 and recover. How many jobs can you create uh, in that kind of environment? You know, you take an example of Kazim Ta'ani, great initiative, great idea, not the first time we are doing this, because you remember uh, before the scandals hit the NYS programs, we had put a fair number of young people uh, in jobs uh, and in different kinds of kinds 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 of, kinds of, kinds of work. So, so I see a lot of ambition, uh, but I do not see the matching investment uh, that, that that comes with that. Now, it's not the first time as a country we are coming up with an economic stimulus program. You will remember that in two thousand and eight to two thousand and ten, uh, President Uhuru was the finance minister then. Uh, recovering from the uh, effects of post-election violence of 2007, he came up with an economic stimulus program uh, the, you know, the, 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 that, that put money in, uh, in, in quite a number of different programs, including Kazi Kwa Vijana uh, and different formats uh, like, like that. The, the two things that are of interest, uh, having, I mean, in, in this particular uh, COVID time, is that one, you have a massive number of people that are losing jobs. So first of all, you had an, a good number that didn't have jobs. So then increased to that, you have another number that has been added uh, to that vulnerability group uh, that because they have lost jobs. Now, this second category is not largely catered for. Because, uh, I mean, Trevor, if you lost your job, you are not going to necessarily dig a trench because you are not even considered as somebody who should be, you know, should, be pro should be providing that kind of labor. But the fact of vulnerability does not exempt you uh, from, and if, if anything, your effects are more because you suck your house help, you send your guy who works back in, the, you know, in your shamba home. Basically, every one employed worker who has a salaried uh, a job feeds a number of families. And I think for me, that's a vulnerability angle that hasn't, seen, hasn't come out very clearly uh, in the economic stimulus program. How do you ensure that these people continue to participate uh, in, the, in the economy? The last point I want to say, these are the very people also who have been driving our revenue, our tax revenue, which is supposed to bring in about 1.5 trillion because an income tax contributes a huge percentage. Uh, uh, my last check is about 44% of our total you know, in, uh, tax revenue. Now, without those people being at work, it yeah. means yeah. that consumption is affected, VAT is affected, import duty is affected, and so does excise, excise duty. So my point is that I see a lot of big ambition, but I feel that this did not appreciate the kind of reality we are facing as a country right now. Thank you. All right. All right, but you started by saying that in some ways this budget addresses the needs of the Kenyans and in some ways it does not. So we know now that the government of Kenya is looking to borrow around 349 billion shillings externally and 486 billion from the domestic market. Do you think then that this economic stimulus package, especially the 8.1, 
really captures the needs of the people, especially the Mwanainchi who Dr. Abram is talking about, the one who have lost their jobs, because there are many economic interventions that have been put there. 24,000 shillings, exempt from pay as you earn. But that is assuming that you have a job to begin with. There's a VAT from 16 to 14%. But we've seen the prices of commodities are still going higher. So is this what we should be dealing with? When, and also when the government is borrowing 486 billion from the domestic market, it means then that they are crowding out the people who would have borrowed from local banks. So are we just really shooting ourselves in the foot here, giving with one hand and taking with another? I think I couldn't have put it uh, better, Trevor, and I think just to resonate with uh, Dr. Rogo's uh, comments in terms of how, how do you expect to generate revenue well, me, myself, who is the taxpayer, does not have a job, where will I get the money to pay the government in form of tax? That's one thing. And, and I think uh, the other thing we also need to be alive to, in addition to your points, uh, Trevor, is that right now, um, well, Kenya's budget is heavily donor funded. And with COVID response, it's, it's become um, every man for himself. So actually donors may not be willing to put in a lot of resources into governments, but governments needing to put in resources from their own pockets. But then again, they don't have uh, that resource to actually uh, finance um, their, their budget, for example. So what I, what I actually envision is by the end of this financial year, um, we'll be unfortunately in a worse uh, situation if we just continue with uh, sort of keeping the situations as, as it is. Uh, we'll be in more, more deficit, uh, we'll have more people losing jobs, and unfortunately we'll also have a more an, a society which is more angry at the government uh, and unhappy with how the government responding is responding if we don't try and see ways of restructuring us, our investments, restructuring even the economic stimulus to ensure that it's it's reaching the people with the biggest need and um, and the most vulnerable. So if it's uh, the unemployed, if it's the people who are getting out of employ and out of employment, if it's women, if it's men, if it's people with disabilities, you know, we need to think about all the vulnerabilities that exist and then see how each uh, each intervention is actually reaching to those people. I think it still feels that um, the sort of uh, individuals or communities or groups of people who are still left behind in this uh with this economic uh with the stimulus package so yeah a uh, lo long story short I, I if we could continue the way we are i just feel like we'll be either in more debt in more deficit with with less revenue uh than we had envisioned that even than we we've sort of um predicted over the years and we keep missing so it it could actually be worse uh if we don't uh, make the right measures thank yeah. you and Lynette, Lynette, you're a research analyst at Treasury. When you're speaking in those corridors and you talk to them, how are they planning to handle the long-term loss of jobs that's coming through? Because this Kevin Gundy, who's also tuned in online, is asking that Kazim Taani is a short-term program that cannot be trusted to spur job creation. First of all, it can't be trusted because people don't trust the government. That's what he's saying. Based on previous experience, we have not much to celebrate about it. Could the panelists explain properly what will be done constructively to address the job loss in the long term? Lynette, what options are you looking at when you speak to the people at Treasury? To answer Kevin Gundy. Okay. So Trevor, uh, the first, uh, in the first place, I would like to appreciate the fact that we should not only look at this from the uh, long term uh, perspective, but also the short term. The, this stimulus, uh, stimulus package is not only offering some sort of income to the Kazipa, to the Vijanas in the Mtani in form of at least this uh, Juakalis and also with the construction. It is also giving an opportunity to the health workers who are, uh, who are certificate holders or diploma holders, at least for a contract of one year. This will not only build their uh, experience, but they can also beef up their CV and when they can go and look for employment from another institution, they can use this uh, experience to get a better uh, position in an institution, for example. So from this perspective, they are not only empowering the youth, but they're also giving them some sort of, uh, like I said, they're giving them some seed capital to at least empower them to become a better citizens and uh, at least empower them even in the middle, in the medium term. 
Uh, but even me, I had an issue with the same stimulus because it is not only uh, not creating consumer, <laughs> sorry, it's not only creating a consumer, not showing a consumer benefit in the long run because the debt sustainability is too high. We can't sustain, uh, we can't be able to pay back these loans. We can't be able to pay back these debts because these jobs that we're creating, they're just in the short term or medium term. But the best part about it is even this, uh, when the government is uh, putting some money in the horticultural sector, in the uh, manufacturing sector, it is also creating opportunities for us as a country to also build up and uh, expand our manufacturing sector, which will create employment opportunities for that other people uh, and also generate more revenue for, for the citizens at large. So essentially this, we are just trying to keep the ship afloat for now. We'll deal with the issues at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the biggest challenge with the stimulus because I, I, I really, personally, I really feel that it doesn't offer the long-term solutions. It all, it's only offering solutions that are, that are seem lucrative just for the short term. Yes, because we, Vijana will have some income. Yes, we won't be registered at the Credit Reference Bureau because you're not paying for your help or your car loads or your stuff. So you may be able to at least keep some money that you can be able to use for transport or use for, uh, for food or even buy internet to teach your children in the house. But how sustainable is this? Because it can't, we can't go on for like, like this for, for a longer period. So even me, yeah. um, yep. I, I really have a challenge with how the government, we as the government are going, we as national children <laughs> are going to handle this problem in the long run because it, it really doesn't look sustainable. I really like your honesty, Lynette, because you're in those <laughs> corridors and even you are wondering how this would happen. And uh, Dr. Rugo, now, what then must the government do to spur economic growth? Because we know even one year after the president said, directed Treasury to pay the pending bills, there was still an allocation for them in the budget, meaning they have not been paid for more than a year. There's the time value of money. 1,000 shillings last year is not the same as 1,000 shillings now. So it means then the people suppliers who are being paid two, three years down the line, the money doesn't give them as much value. So what must the government do then to spur economic growth going forward, keeping in mind that we're dealing with a pandemic? Th th thanks. I, I think, uh, first, let, let me just jump in a bit on the ES, I mean, the economic stimulus program. That economic stimulus programs are not lifetime programs. Uh, these are programs that are supposed to be heavy investment by government, short term, but mass reach. Uh, so basically what they are doing is basically saying, we have so many people out there Without economic activity, companies start going down, they start underperforming, they will shut down. So you put in some money, uh, employ, and that's why you see a big portion of the money is about employing more teachers, employing doctors, and I mean nurses and uh, community health workers, it's about Kazim Tani. It's about sparring economic activity in the short term when there is a insufficiency uh, of money in the economy. Basically, it's like government just putting money into an economy, but the only way to spar that uh, because then you cannot start sending, like, for instance, food uh, uh, to households and the like. But their expectation is that after about a year or so, things come back to normal, and then the normal economic processes, I mean, the normal processes of employment creation uh, and income earning and household uh, uh, support come back uh, to, to, to its place. But, but let, let, let's me now come to your question. I think there are, there, are, there are two things that must happen in tandem. Uh, and, uh, and here I will also borrow uh, the thoughts of uh, one David D. Uh, and, and also a couple of other people who have written uh, on this, this matter. That at this particular time, the biggest job of government is to make sure that companies and corporations that create employment stay afloat. Then the second one is making sure that those who must be laid off have a means uh, to, 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 to sustain themselves in two ways. Have a means either, first of all, by reducing their, uh, uh, their expenses. So that's why then there is a discussion around, you know, loans can be, uh, uh, you know, a moratorium on repayment of personal loans, not being, uh, you know, listed on the credit, credit reference bureau, uh, and a couple of other expenses that families would, would normally incur are reduced. Uh, so, so that then they can be able to, 
Uh, and of course, the other one is direct cash transfer uh, to those households uh, uh, so, so that then they can be able to engage. I think there's a big role in ensuring that uh, are the first uh, uh, that, that companies do not go under. And when we talk about companies, sometimes we talk as though we are talking about big institutions. Basically, we are saying making sure that the barber shop doesn't go under. I know it looks very small, but that is where employment creation in our economy happens. You know, it's making sure uh, that manufacturing, uh, you know, farms, farms, some flower farms have sent people home. You know, some, uh, uh, you know, vegetable farms have sent people home because then there's not much more uh, export. So I think there is, there is that. But then on the second uh, row is that a big challenge that we are having is that the government of Kenya is a big, big player in the economy. And therefore, that with the government withdrawing its economic activity or its purchasing power, then you are left without money circulating uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the economy. So if government is not advertising, if government is not purchasing uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, flowers for offices, if government is not purchasing newspapers, if government is not doing all those, uh, those kind of uh, uh, activities. And that's why then the discussion right now is can that same energy, you know, first of all, be matched by a reduction in expenses of government because then those activities are not happening, but that be channeled towards the guaranteeing of credit uh, for micro and small enterprises. I think I think there's a there's a there's a big piece. So so one big role uh, to keep the economy running and to save us for the long term is to make sure that people don't go under. It's cheaper to sustain to put somebody on life support than to try and revive them after they are dead, uh, as 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 it were. Uh, the second one is government engagement in the credit market. You rightly noted that government is planning uh, to borrow about 840 billion, uh, 450 or uh, thereabout of that is gonna be coming from the local market, which means then even as economic activity is not happening, uh, banks have no people to lend money to, and even the few who would like to come are going to be competing with government uh, for credit. Now that cannot happen. You know, I mean, if, if it's Trevor on one side and National Treasury on the other side, government will look at the National Treasury because there's an assurance uh, of, of that. But that's only something that can happen by government self-censoring itself, you know, and not playing in that particular market so that then that money is available. And the way to make sure that there is economic activity is by guaranteeing those who are borrowing. Because the biggest worry right now is, will Trevor pay back? Will Abraham pay back? That is where now government comes in to save the economy for the long for the long run. By and there is a credit refer I sorry there is a credit guarantee scheme that has been proposed, but I think it needs to be expanded even for the smaller uh, uh, actors in the economy. All right, I'd like to hear all your thoughts on this, and this is a, con a question being posed by Amos Chacha. He's posing it to all of you, and Miss Karen Bet, you'll be the first to take on this answer. Amos Church is wondering, what is the best approach the government should put in place to help those industries that are laying off workers to pick up fast after the pandemic and rehire them? Ms. Bed? Sorry, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Trevor, and also thanks to Amos for that question. I think as Abraham has said, um, the best, the starting point is to cushion those small and medium-sized enterprises so if it's access to credit you know cushioning if they have loans uh, guarantees and things like that so that they don't have a reason to lay workers obviously they're not generating any revenue at the moment because they're not making sales they're not exporting they're not uh, you know they're not getting uh, that traffic of customers as they were before so how what sort of incentives can you give them so that they still generate some revenue or they stagger uh, their expenses so that they don't uh, feel the dent and i think one other thing also and this is actually what government needs to do rather than what um, private sector or smes need to do is while the economic stimulus package is about giving um, guarantees and loans and access to credit, I am also aware that the government may not have a very robust register of these SMEs. For example, uh, we have a very strong informal sector. So actually, how can government give credit to uh, 
uh, an institution which is not in uh, as which is not registered under the business register so again how will government decide which institutions to give uh, access to credit or give any uh, economic stimulus if the register uh, for, uh, for for these businesses is not robust enough so thinking also on how can government build in systems so that when it comes to the next shock or the next pandemic, they're actually ready to cushion this SMEs who, uh, who exist within uh, the country. I think the other point also is um, minimizing government expenditure. And this has been mentioned before. I know one of the economic uh, stimulus package, I think it's the eighth point around manufacturing is purchasing uh, locally manufactured vehicles for ministries, departments, and agencies. And could that, could I, I could such resources be repurposed to actually reach to, to the SMEs rather than the big manufacturing? I say this because um, it's COVID times, you know, movement is restricted. Why would we be purchasing more vehicles rather than um, sort of using that, in, uh, that those resources to pump money into the SMEs? So those are some of the uh, key interventions I think government should do uh, in terms of strengthening their systems to ensure that they provide the uh, support to the, the SMEs in the lowest sort of the lowest bracket or the ones with the biggest need. And uh, you agree with me, it's the Mama Bogas, it's the Juakalis, it's the Papa Shops, it's the salons, you know, it's those small yeah. businesses. And also it's the digital economy where the youth uh, are starting to, to venture in. So that would be the priority and seeing how to, how to push on those ones. Thanks. Okay, and and Lynette, let me bring you in on this. And it's imp it's important what Ms. Karen Bet is talking about. Yes, it's point number eight on the economic stimulus package, where there's an enforcing a policy of buy Kenya, build Kenya, six hundred million shillings of it. What is the argument behind buying cars using that money, Lynette? Uh, of course, when you invest, uh, the the best and uh, the most ideal. Uh, uh, situation, the most ideal thing that you can do, undertake as a country is, in, is in investing in yourself. And that is by manufacturing these cars inside our, in our own country and also selling them within our own country. We not only create employment opportunities by uh, manufacturing these cars locally, but also create uh, selling them also creates revenue, generates revenue that will circulate in the economy. I wanted to also add on to what Karen had uh, talked about with regards to these SMEs. Uh, she talked about uh, the credits being uh, given to SMEs. I also wanted to add on to that and also uh, point out the stimuli that the government was putting in place with regards to uh, refunding, refunding the SMEs at least 10 billion Kenya shillings uh, from KRA and also trying to pay suppliers at least 13 billion Kenya shillings to enable circulation of funds. This circulation of funds can, all, can not only uh, improve the, our manufacturing industry, it can also be channeled into other industries, uh, be it fishing, be it uh, farming, be it um, uh, food production. So this, mo this money, if it circulates in all uh, the various sectors in our economy, it generates income that is building Kenya as a country. Dr. Abram, do you agree with that uh, approach, especially on the point number eight, where there's 600 million for buy Kenya, build Kenya, and yet we haven't really addressed the cost of production? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. So the I'm conflicted because I feel that uh, the, the buy Kenya, build Kenya has got... Uh, has got more critical aspects of it that, uh, that, are, that, that are a bit different from just cars. Because whether you buy Kenya, build Kenya, Volkswagen, the profit goes to Volkswagen Group. Uh, it doesn't go to Thika, uh, Thika, Thika municipality uh, or Kiambu County, as it were. Of course, a couple of people are employed uh, in that particular particular space. They pay tax in here. But the reality is that the, the, the greater <laughs> return on investment goes to uh, the Volkswagen, Volkswagen Group. But if you think about buy Kenya, build Kenya at a more critical level, I mean, how many government offices particularly uh, have furniture that is built in Kenya? Uh, and yet that is where, you know, the guys on Gong Road, the guys across different uh, spaces, you know, 
uh, you know, in Bonden, in Nakuru, where they produce furniture, they produce, uh, you know, clo clothing and materials and the like, and the like. I think that's where the focus, in my opinion, because that's where the employment is en masse. You know, when, when you think about the materials that are, I mean, the, the kind of furniture, the kind of day-to-day uh, -day expenses, because vehicles are bought once uh, uh, in, in a big while uh, for use. Uh, in the when you think about mechanics and you know and, and the kind of space that they operate, I think that's where the investment, uh, particularly when you look at it from the perspective of an economic stimulus program, you want to target areas that have got the highest, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, where you can make uh, the least investment with the highest impact, so to say, because you don't have unlimited amounts. Because when you think of things yeah. like uh, paying 13 billion for pending bills, the pending bills, the last time I checked, I think were at about 350 billion at the national level. Uh, and I think about uh, 70 or there about billion at the county, at the county level. So, I mean, compare that with 13 billion uh, and, 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 and you, you see there's some maths there uh, that is not, uh, when you think about the tax refunds, uh, VAT refunds of 10 billion, uh, as far as I know, I think those VAT refunds that are due are running, you know, in the upwards of 100 billion. Uh, I, I mean, uh, so, so, so the point is that with an economic stimulus program, you want to go for what will be able to stimulate a greatest activity. And as I said earlier, is where you are able, first of all, uh, to sustain companies that are operating uh, and that are engaging. But secondly, that you are able to engage with people who have no means of livelihood uh, and therefore be able to give them uh, economic. Uh, so, 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 so as I said at the beginning, I think it's a great idea, uh, but I think it, yeah. it is better when it is diversified uh, so, so that then manufacturing doesn't just become, uh, um, you know, uh, just vehicles. Vehicles, I think, yeah. are on the other side of the pendulum. You know, there are more other critical aspects of the economic activity that could spur uh, the economic uh, 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 engagement in Kenya. All right. Let's bring in Ms. Karen Bett on this. And looking at the budget, we know a third of it, 940.7 billion is debt payment. 1.8 billion is the current expenditure. Development only has about half a trillion shillings. So essentially the debt we're saying to every 100 shillings, 55 shillings goes to debt. And this is related to a question on Twitter from Gosale who says that the current budget for 2020-2021 seems devoted to recurrent expenditure instead of development. Shouldn't the latter inform the former to sustain growth? Ms. Beth. Thanks, and thanks to Gusale for that question. I think over time, even if you look at the budget, not this year, over years, recurrent has always been bigger than development. Clearly, you know, it's, it's not new because it's 2021 that the recurrent is bigger than development. And I think partly it's because recurrent is mostly to pay wages, salaries, you know, the day-to-day -day running of the office. Development is, uh, as, the, as the name suggests, more, uh, more long-term investment. So um, is that a good thing that recurrent is bigger than development? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, um, if we need to keep government in their jobs also, then they need the salaries. But I think how do we balance so that we make sure that um, you know there's a balance between the recurrent and development. I would expect it to be a bit 50-50, uh, and especially in this time with the economic stimulus package where we're making more investments in, uh, in projects and development, uh, that the, it would get into a 50-50 balance. But I think over time, um, I begin to know maybe uh, what, how other countries balance the, rec uh, the recurrent and development, but I think it, it's always been, um, that sort of inequality in terms of bigger recurrence, smaller development. But um, I'm hoping uh, maybe in the coming years, government can actually see ways of ensuring that development is increasingly and um, sustainably, uh, you know, big, becoming bigger than yes, recurrent. Yes. And the reason, the reason why I would, I would, I would suggest this and just to touch on uh, actually one of the things is the is so, the cousin um, Jan, sorry about which is a that. very manual um sorry sorry just hold on one second honorable isaac Moura, uh, thank you so much for tuning in we recognize your presence just kindly mute your microphone and then we'll engage you in just a bit lynette you're finishing your thoughts yeah thanks um so i was just saying like if if we keep the current big you know it's not sustainable because 
uh, the example of the Kazi, Kazi Mutani project is, is very manual. You know, in other, um, institu in other countries, this is a mechanical job. You know, you need machines to, to be cleaning. You only need one person to sort of supervise. So how do we move our systems and our institutions to actually more uh, using more technology, more mechani mechanized ways of doing things so that we actually now get that to current expenditure much lower than development, which would be the ideal, um, the ideal balance. Thanks. All right. Joining us now is Honorable Isaac Moura. Thank you so, so much for making time for us. I don't know whether you can hear us clearly. And before you joined in, there was a conversation around the economic stimulus package, Honorable Moura, where there's a general feel that it doesn't really address the issues that the youth really have. Because the main concern was how is it beyond the economic stimulus package, Honorable Moura? Just kindly unmute your microphone, and if you're with us, Honorable Isaac Moura. Honorable Isaac Moura is the acting chair for the Senate Committee on Budget and Finance. He's just joined uh, us now. But before we yeah, get into so, the, yeah, yeah. Yes, so I think, Moura, uh, can hear you now. I think uh, it's very, very important to speak about what is happening, because majority of the people uh, really would not be able to get the 35 billion uh, or the 53 billion or the 7 billion, whichever that you look at it from the various stimulus packages. What is important though is to look at how that money can circulate. Even if those students who can access are able to have uh, that money trickle down to the other sectors of the economy. And uh, also because uh, now also the borrowing culture is very low as a result of the fact that Trevor, people are ambivalent about whether they can have uh, you know, high circulation in terms of business, in terms of uh, uh, daily, uh, you know, daily transactions. So basically, yeah, it's a big challenge, but at the same time also, uh, we must also look at this from the part of the fact that there's a lot of spending in government uh, towards COVID-19 with very limited oversight roles. So I think uh, these are some of the things that we need to look at. All right, Honorable Ora, before you joined us, there was a question from one Kevin Gondi there. Kevin Gondi was wondering how, how the job losses are going to be sustained in long term. What is the government making sure, how are you making sure as a government that the job losses will be addressed in the long term? Nobody really anticipated uh, this uh, whole loss. And so therefore, we are seeing a very serious challenge with regards to how um, people are reacting to uh, the job losses. Because you see now, sectors had already projected that they are going to be making money. But then government also is clueless, it's good to say that. That government is actually clueless with regards to how to handle it. Uh, and even when you look at the stimulus packages that are being given, maybe for those who had some kind of reserve, because if you also tell the, the hotel industry that they are going to get two billion shoes for innovation, what's up? How many will actually be thinking about innovation when they do not have even bed occupancy? I mean, I talked to one of the, of the owners of the big hotels and uh, he says his greatest challenge right now is to have somebody sleep on a pillow at night. So really, basically, it's difficult. And um, uh, yes, there is this Kazi Mtaani uh, for, for, for people. I uh, mean, for young people, I think in the 10 billion uh, you know, package, it is aimed at ensuring that you stimulate the local economy and that you have the young people you know, generate the economy. Of course, it's also the cash transfer that also is targeting the lower echelons of the society. That is most welcome. That is really, really most welcome. But in terms of big business, in terms of start startups, uh, you, you, you are aware that uh, the CBK governor said by June is the end of this year, about 5 million SMEs are likely to close down because our economy is basically hand to mouth, you know. We, 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 we collect every money uh, on that, then we share, you know, in terms of government. But I think I must also comment one thing that I have seen that has worked very well, which is what you call signal, signaling, where you actually open the economy without opening. You say, we are going to open. And you have seen with that, then there's an increase in traffic, people are going back to work. That has really helped because otherwise we would have been facing uh, the economy, you know, having total collapse. So, so that's really something we need to say. And I have also seen a revision of our growth from at least 1% to 
about 2.3 percent by the Bretton Woods institutions. We need a more realistic one from the Parliamentary Budget Office because sometimes the national treasury projections are yeah. actually overestimated. Yeah, and Honorable Maura, you are the acting chair of Senate Committee Budget and Finance. And there's a question here from Christine Dung, who is wondering how the government ensure that the youth actually get paid their dues under the Kazim Tani initiative. I think they, they, they will have to devise ways in which to make sure that they make the payments. But the biggest challenge that we have, Trevor, is that uh, it is a bit obscure. I mean, I have been involved, for example, in ensuring that we have more monies allocated to disabled persons. And I had requested 2 billion of the 10 billion, but I'm yet to get answers. Of course, I was able to receive another 200 million for distribution, which is currently obtaining. But for these young people, you know, there's always the issue of who gets listed. Is it through nepotism? Of course, you can, you can pay through a mobile money transfer system, but it, it is, is it very fearful that you are able to know that the people who are given the money are the same people who are actually working? Otherwise, if that is not uh, you know, verified, then, then it cannot just be another conduit for corruption because numbers are just numbers. People can have MPSA accounts, you know? So that is a big, big challenge, and we wouldn't want to have divest, divestiture with regards to management to stimulate the local economy being taken offshore. And you have seen yeah. even the recent report uh, from, from the World Bank about uh, you know, hundreds of billions of shillings from Kenya, which actually were, were invested back in the tax habit. So these are some of the things that we need to look at. Uh, but basically, I would yeah. want to say that uh, uh, we have seen a reduction of the civil society with regards to social yeah. accountability and oversight. We want to hear more of this process right. at the grassroots level. Honorable Moro, I know you're in another function. So I'm trying to get as much of your thoughts as possible before I let you go. Do you believe number eight of the economic stimulus package, which is enforcing the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, 600 million shillings to get to vehicles that are locally assembled, is that the right place to put that money? I think that's, that's commendable, Trevor. It's good to give credit for this deal because if we are importing 80,000 vehicles per, per year, and you can see the supply chain in terms of, in terms of the, the, the second hand for spare parts. Is it impossible? And you see, these yeah. these are uh, the, the local uh, market markets. They're actually meant for, for, for. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello, can you hear me? you're back now. Yes, yes go ahead, you're back now. For, 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 the, for, the, for the, sorry. They are, they are not meant for the local terrain. So if we have a local investment of a vehicle that is cheaper, about 700,000 shillings, that can be used by as many cases as possible, it will make a long, long, uh, a very great difference in society. But you just mentioned now that about 5 million SMEs are going to go under because of this COVID-19. Shouldn't that money be pumped towards them? Because there are more. Uh, no, this is the longer term. You know, this this cannot be seen in the short term, because obviously, Trevor will not be in COVID nineteen forever. I am talking about uh, you, you go in that direction because we cannot over import second hand refurbished vehicles from Japan and other jurisdictions. We can manufacture our own. All right, Ramora, thanks. Steve, with us if you can, but we will understand because I know there's another function you're in. Just kindly mute your microphone for us, and then I'll engage the others that with the, the panelists that are still with us. Lynette, there's so many concerns about these allocations of cash on, from different places, and I want to see if I can bring in one comment here from Shamim Juma who says the government gives with the left hand but grabs more with the right. Is the patriotic tax for SMEs really necessary during these unnerving times? The businesses are struggling and you want to impose more. Kindly be considerate. Lynette. <laughs> uh, thanks, Shamim, for that question. I do believe that uh, just as uh, my, panel, my fellow panelists have commented, that uh, this uh, stimulus is not, is not supposed to give a solution for the long term. It's supposed to just at least give a fair solution for the short term to enable these SMEs to be able to get back on their feet and continue with their business as normal. So uh, the president also gave, uh, one of the, the directives that he gave was a reduction in uh, taxes from 30% to around 25% corporate tax. So I believe this, with this reduction in the corporate tax, it can enable these 
uh, SMEs to be able to have more cash flows to at least put themselves back to normal so that they can all generate more revenue. And even if the government is taking from them, as, they, as Shamim is saying, as well, in the long run, it's, it will be for the benefit of every Mwanainchi because the government will be able to pay back the loans that we have uh, yeah. taken on board and be able to just give any local services that get the government give. Yeah, and Dr. Rugo, Lynette is bringing in a very interesting aspect because we seem like we are caught between a rock and a hard place. The government is looking to get as much revenue as possible, but the people have also been taxed to the level that they feel the taxation is too high. And this is what uh, Shamim is talking about, the patriotic tax. There's the turnover tax. But we know, I think it was in either 2017, the government imposed a tax on senator. And the amount that they ended up recouping in that year was less than what they had the previous year because all of a sudden people will now go for some an alternative something that is much cheaper what what do we have the right taxation policies in this country dr rugo from where you stand one of them being the turnover tax that is also then the patriotic tax that shamim is complaining about uh th thanks and i and i share with uh, you know the frustrations of many kenyans that uh uh, our, our tax systems uh, and our tax uh, mechanisms are, are quickly reaching their limits. Uh, and, and, and I think it's important for us to say that uh, that is very evident because uh, with all the tax measures that the minister announced, uh, if they were to be followed through, they are only likely to bring in an addition of 39.3 billion uh, into the tax, uh, into the tax bracket. I mean, basically, uh, into the tax uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, but the, the, the challenge with taxation in this country has been, from, from my point, has been twofold. First of all, uh, uh, and, 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 and Kenyans, uh, let's just accept this, that there are not many of us as Kenyans who actually pay and declare our true taxes. Uh, so when you look at the number of people who, who return, uh, who make tax returns, uh, we are still at below 3 million. Now, there are many more people, many more Kenyans who are involved in uh, economic activity for which they can contribute. But the reasons I have had and the reasons that I share is the fact that uh, many still have to meet the same costs for the services they would have expected the taxes to provide. So you have run your business, you still have to worry about your own security, you still have to worry about your cleaning, uh, which should be done by government. You still have to worry about water. You still have to worry about education for your children, where you will live. I mean, all those extras that you still have to incur. Uh, so, so, so that the, the, the tax bracket remains, uh, the tax base remains very, uh, very constrained, uh, and seems only to push further everybody who have uh, to try and deal with that. I think that's why there has been now an introduction on multiplicity of tax measures. Uh, for, uh, for, 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 for goods and products that I consider that will just push in increasing vulnerability. So for instance, uh, when you introduce a tax on LPG, uh, when you reintroduce re tax uh, on petroleum products, knowing very well that petrol has got a big, big multiply effect in the cost of production, uh, you know, when, when, when you, 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 you intend to even tax uh, uh, tractors, which has got a direct implication in the cost of production of agriculture products, uh, when you introduce um, tax on uh, pensioners and pension schemes uh, and the like. So, so that then, uh, then it becomes, so the first challenge is the base, and that's where you're seeing all these measures uh, that are being tried left, right, center, uh, to try and, 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 and increase, uh, uh, increase. The second one is, of course, there's a discussion to be held about the bonds you know, uh, uh, which have been considered to be too low uh, in the sense that as soon as you hit, uh, is it 100,000? Um, you know, somebody earning more, less, earning less than 200,000, somebody earning, they're almost being taxed at the same measure, you know, in terms of percentages. Uh, uh, and, and there somebody can make an argument for unfairness uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the system. Why should somebody, you know, earning 300,000 be subjected to the same tax as one earning, uh, you know, two million shillings or, 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 or a million bob and, and, and above. So, but the bigger challenge is the, is the challenge of how do you cushion people who are vulnerable by not taxing 
uh, basic things. You know, in other countries, for instance, uh, we were having a conversation earlier, you have uh, agriculture inputs zero rated, not even tax exempt, zero rated uh, from VAT, uh, which means then the cost of production goes, da goes lower. That's why we, we, are, we, are, we are buying fruits from South Africa, uh, having done all the distance up to here and still are cheaper than our locally, uh, locally produced uh, produced uh, progress. So, so there's that, the balancing of making sure that we can be able to, uh, 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 you know, uh, make the, the, the proper return. And I think there's a patriotic duty there uh, for, for Kenyans to be able to pay tax. But the government has to fulfill in countries where tax is not debated as much, is that government provides the services that are requisite, you know. Uh, so, it's, it's what we've called the social contract, that the social contract is honored, that the services that I am paying for are provided so i don't have to go and provide for myself privately what should be a public a public good uh, or, or service and of course lastly why there is also a bit of a lot of pressure uh, on, on on tax is simply because we have not been living within our means uh, and the options we have chosen uh, uh, have not helped us either because the kind of loans we are taking as a country basically are just pushing us to the wall uh, uh, father and, and, and father. So, so I think for me, that's a concern, balancing how we are spending, but also proper tax reforms that do not create vulnerabilities uh, more than what we already have. Thanks. Yeah, Rugo, now that you brought up the issue of loans, and I want to bring in Ms. Karen on this, just to, to bounce this off you. The Budget and Appropriations Committee recommended that Kenya should seek moratoriums. Yeah. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Because essentially, we're still going to pay back anyway. We're just seeking a grace period for now. Um, so the, I mean, let me, let me unpack the figure that we are talking about. So this year alone, we are going to be spending 904.7 uh, billion in tax repayment. I mean, sorry, in debt repayment, 580 of that is interest. Uh, and the rest is principal. Now, if you, in, if you add the, the, the intended borrowing for 2020, 2021 of, uh, 840 billion, they are already, we are already at this. I remember we are at 6.3 trillion in terms of debt, total, total debt. Now, Kenya was, uh, uh, was upgraded. I think that's the right term to say from, uh, 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 you know, uh, to, 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 to a lower middle income country. And therefore, uh, the conversation around tax relief, we are out of that box. So the, 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 the tax relief business, that belongs to other poorer fellows uh, than, than ourselves. So the only option we are left with is two options. One is a renegotiation of the terms, which means uh, increasing the period of repayment uh, and reducing the amount that we pay month on month. So if we were to pay within five years, we increase it maybe to 10 years, then we... The other one is to seek a moratorium where we say this year, we are a basket case, we have no money. So please, anybody who was expecting money from us, can we have that conversation uh, thereafter? Now that is possible. If we are dealing with your standard uh, uh, bilateral partners who are giving us loans on concessional terms, which basically means low interest, longer term kind of uh, engagement where the goal is not profit. But a huge portion of our debt as currently constituted, it has moved to commercial type of debt. So basically it's you trying to go and have a negotiation with your bank. Uh, that you are not able to pay your loan, your mortgage for the next six months, uh, 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 as, as compared to you having a discussion with your fellow Chama members uh, to allow you uh, two more months, because anyway, they cannot even see the kind of situation you are in, then you will pay. So Kenya finds itself in that lock of commercial debtors, I mean, uh, debtors who are not in a position to have a conversation because they also have people who have invested in that. Yeah. Of course, one could argue then, could there be interest even within government about this commercial uh, kind of loans? But that's a conversation maybe that is beyond uh, this platform. I would have been happy uh, with the members of parliament being here to tell us a bit more. But that's a, that's a conundrum that we find ourselves in. That on one hand, the moratorium is a good way to go. If you ask me, when you're spending 905 billion, which basically means you're spending 55 shillings of every 100 shillings, you expect to collect. Not that you have. Remember, this is an expectation of economic activity that will happen later, and then there will be tax revenue. Uh, um, 
I would go for that kind of an option to discuss a moratorium or a debt yeah. renegotiation. And I think okay. those are options that are still on the table. All right. Ms. Karen, what are your thoughts? Because there's a question here from Nashan Mudama, who's saying, why wouldn't the government not renegotiate the repayment of its loans and utilize the amount allocated to repay them, which is almost 900 billion, is to push on the economy from the effects of COVID-19. At least 500 billion would have stabilized the economy compared to the 57 billion, which will be used as a, which he calls a drop in the ocean. Ms. Karen? Yeah, I think, um, and thanks for that and for the question. I think the, the two options of renegotiation or moratorium, of course, are on the table, but even just giving you a very practical example which probably most of the people in this call have gone through if you have uh if you're servicing a loan now with your bank how easy has that conversation with your bank been to negotiate for a loan how has it been asking the bank that hey i can't pay now i want to start paying in six months you know they're looking at your credit worthiness how have you been repaying before have you been repaying uh consistently how big is your loan? You know, those kinds of questions is also the questions that the government is going to get, especially because the loans are commercial. So yes, those are the two options uh, which look possible. But I mean, if it's an investor and they're out to make profit and they're also struggling in their countries uh, in terms of generating revenue, you know, it's not going to be an easy conversation. And it's even made worse that you have to do it online. You don't need, you cannot travel and meet physically to negotiate for this, um, this uh, moratorium or uh, renegotiating the, uh, the debt. So it's, it's a good option. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fair. Uh, it's being uh, understanding of the current situations, but it, it will really be also um, a, a difficult conversation to have with the, with the, uh, with the, with the people who have uh, loaned the country. Yeah. And Lynette, let me bring you in on this. We know now that the ICT budget in the budget that has just been read has been cut from 28.3 billion in 2019 to 14.3 billion this year. Yet the presidency's budget has been increased to 36.6 billion from 11.3 billion last year, at a time when the rallying call is technology fast. Isn't this a counterproductive move? Uh, we do believe that the president, uh, the budget in ICT has increased because uh, even borrowing a leaf from the stimulus, we saw the, and the various directives that the, the president was putting in place in terms of digitalizing each and every aspect of the, 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 the uh, implementing the stimulus, for example, they were, for, they were paying um, the beneficiaries of this uh, 10 billion that uh, the, the, sorry, the president was trying to allocate to the vulnerable people, putting in place uh, measures that will uh, digitalize uh, every system in terms of payments to the farmers. They want to use the e-voucher system to pay, to give, for example, loans to farmers to be able to uh, have some uh, inputs to use in the farming. Will uh, will make uh, will ent entail. Sorry, just give me some minutes to put my thoughts in place. Just give me a minute. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Honorable Moura, I see you're back with us again. We were talking about the issue of looking at the debt levels that we have right now. So we know as it stands, our deficit alone is 7.3% of our GDP, which is bigger than our projected growth, which was about 6.1%. Now it's been revised to 2.5%. So what options are we looking at to know to to make sure that local borrowing doesn't definitely lead to crowding out? Because as a legislator, aren't you concerned that when the government itself is borrowing more than 486 billion from the domestic market, isn't it crowding out the people who SMEs, the small SMEs, the 5 million SMEs that you're saying are going to go under from getting access to credit? Honorable Moura. Yeah, Trevor, I think that's very, very, very good observation. Number one is to actually say that uh, I fully have been very involved in this issue of public debt because according to my studies, you need to borrow between 20, 28 to 35% for you to be in a stable macro equilibrium. But then if you look at the debt borrowed uh, since 2013, it's much more than all of the governments you know, uh, combined since independence. 
And uh, if you look at our revised GDP, it's now at about 10 trillion. I had estimated it to be about 9.8 trillion. But Trevor, the challenge that we are having with this is the fact that uh, we expanded government uh, without to, to those new governments. Yeah, but then by the end of the day, we are in in, a, in limbo because uh, by the end of the day, we have a, we have a, a situation where individuals uh, uh, in government continue to load their wish lists into the development expenditure. The county governments are also over reliant on uh, uh, monies from the center, and at the same time, the the cost of projects has got, uh, gone exponential. I mean, have you not noted? that we no longer talk about projects worth millions. We are talking about billions, you see. And the return on, on investment is very low. So eventually, uh, we do not have a very uh, a big fiscal space because you are talking about uh, 9 trillion from 6 to 9 trillion, but the money is already borrowed is more than the 6 trillion, you see. Actually, my estimate is higher. Uh, it's actually around uh, 7.8. It's not actually 7.3, my estimate. Because one of the things that you need to, to grapple with is uh, official statistics from, from, from the national treasury are not realistic. But now, what is the solution? So number one, we need to stop borrowing expensive commercial debt. We need to restructure our, our, our expenditure. And COVID-19 would have given us a very good opportunity. But then you see the Minister for National Treasury still reading a budget of 2.7 trillion, when our collection is not going to be more than 1.5 trillion if we did ever better, because Kerry has said it's only going to co collect 65%. So the deficit is always understated, you see? And at the same time, the companies, the banks are the ones who are doing us in, Trevor, because they would like to borrow to government, and they're also borrowing with, uh, on average of five to seven years at an average of 11%, you see? And then government, because of not wanting to go to Britain with, with institutions where they're getting you know, concessional loans of 1% for about 10, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, they prefer these commercial loans because of, of the private sector interest and the lobbying in, within government. But also, uh, even externalized debt is actually for high commercial because all of a sudden we said we rebased our economy. And now and we are being told we are a low and middle income economy. So we need, therefore, our legislation to do two things. Is that number one, when you want to lift the debt ceiling, you, it is not a matter of regulation. It should be a matter of legislation. Number two, there should be a legislation that also caps the, the domestic borrowing to a certain percentage so that you leave out monies for private sector development and investment. Now, number three, you need to differentiate uh, between the National Treasury and the Ministry for Planning and Finance. We need to have those separated so that the National Treasury is an independent entity that is able to superintend over our treasury with regards yeah. to national and county government. Because currently, the national treasury is actually captured by the Ministry for Finance. Yeah. And Rebel Moura, you are the acting chair, Senate Committee, Budget and Finance, and you have very solid plans when you speak to us on this platform. How are they being received in places where they actually matter? What do they say? Why is this rocket science? The solutions are coming from yourself, and you've just articulated most of them right now. My brother, I, I mean, I've just started acting. I've been the vice chair, but I was also a ranking member in the National Assembly Budget Committee for three years. The challenge we have is that we do not have the willingness of people to do what is right. In fact, I had told Mutava Musiemi, the former chair of finance, the one who was before Kimani Shongwa in the National Assembly, that in 10 years, we will not have a country, Trevor. We, it has come early. Christmas has come early because people have not been listening. We have been over consuming, you see. And, and, and I think uh, it, the, the, it's not very well received because everybody wants to defend their budget. But because we are not going to an election tomorrow and we have a president who may not be, uh, who, may, who, who is not uh, wanting to be reelected again because he has done his two terms, this is the time you crack the whip. This is the time you do what you call fiscal consolidation. This is the time you also do budget restructuring. This is how you, 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 you negotiate for, for debt. I mean, because we cannot be paying 900 billion for, for debt alone. And yet, most of this is actually interest. So it is, it is I mean, I have, I have been on record. I mean, I have gone public about the situation of our country. Sometimes it's not received very well. You, you get jitters around here. But you see, we cannot bury our head in the sun. We must speak this volubly and loudly because it is our co collective uh, you know, heritage. We've got to ensure that we have 
uh, uh, you know, enough uh, resources to, 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 to finance our development and to sustain the country. And that's currently where we are going. We are going, we don't, sometimes you feel like we're going very fast, but we, we don't know where we are going to, you see? So, so, so I personally think um, we need serious conversation. We, if we need to, do, to, re to reduce the size of government. Trevor, how much money goes to, to state-owned enterprises? How, yeah. uh, either in terms of the commercial ones or the, what, the ones we call semi-autonomous government. What, yeah. Why don't we have a sunset clause for them? Why yeah. are they bodies in perpetuity, even when they have not receive their mandate all they have uh, since uh, you know uh, data like the kenya size of board who does say for anymore in this country so those yeah. kind of conversations need to be done and then also further we need to move away from what you call financial audit to performance audit mm -hmm. financial audit to performance audit where you actually look at the value for money but you see we are so we are so interested in the bottom line, but we don't quite actually see the value for money. How do you explain yeah. a kilometer of road, Dongokundu, costing one billion shillings per kilometer? How? How do you explain that? You know? So, so some of these things, and then also in terms of investment in technologies that reduce the cost uh, you know, of implementation. I mean, that, that because of the, 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 the economies of entrepreneurship have increased public debt to exponential levels. And because this same money goes around, it is invested in, in those offshore accounts, then it comes back through the banks, and then the banks, or even through those euro bonds, and then it is actually borrowed by the same government. And you saw that. I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, rocket science. Yeah, this is something that has happened and it has properly been documented. All right. And to recognize the presence of Honorable Sabina Shege, who's just joining us now. Thank you so much for making time for us, Mweshimiwa. And we were talking about the budget and the economic stimulus packages. Are you happy? as a legislator, that this addresses the issues that the people have been speaking to you about? Honorable Sabina. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Reva, and I'm sorry for joining in late. We had a communication from our speaker who was sitting this afternoon, and the communication took more than one hour, and you know when the speaker is on the street, you can move, so apologies for coming in late. Uh, but I can say not fully satisfied. We've been trying. We know we are facing tough economical times. And so what the government has provided for this financial 2020-2021 financial year is just not enough. And so looking at the challenges we are facing as a nation, of course, as a chair of health, I'm very concerned about the COVID and even the post-COVID. We have the issues of floods, we have, the, we have issues of locusts, and so uh, high level of unemployment, and of course, trying to cushion the business people. Uh, it's quite a challenge. And I was just having a look at um, what the, 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 the CF Treasury presented. Now, a few things that has really had an impact was um, uh, issues like on tax from, you know, it moved from 16 to 14. The corporate and pay move from you know thirty percent to twenty five percent, and of course the people earning less than twenty four thousand were given full tax relief. But uh, I will not say that's enough. So, uh, there, there are some of the things that Kenyans, and especially creating employment for our young people, I might be disadvantaged to get into this discussion because I was not listening in. So I'm not so sure on what you have covered and yeah. what you've lost covered. But um, of course, there have been our efforts to give the cash transfer to the venerable, which was increased to an amount of around uh, 10 billion, notably 13.1 billion for pending bills. And you know, a lot of our business people, and even uh, youth and women are also the ones who are trading with the government and then the government doesn't pay. And we have seen many business people suffering when they, the government doesn't pay their, what they have already supplied. We had the money for food to caution yeah. the affected household, even 400 million. I don't know how many households it would and how sustainable that is. Yeah. And so uh, looking forward also to see how the implementer has in Tani, because the, 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 the the promise of uh, the creation of jobs for I am people, the 26,000, they did the pilot in Kiambu, maybe Mora will tell us how it went in, the, in his county. Uh, it has not gotten to my county yet for us to be able to look at it. I understand the chiefs are the ones who are giving the list of the young people. Uh, the leaders ourselves, were, were no, it was not clear on uh, the formula to get these young people to actually enjoy it. And they were saying they are targeting 100,000 youth. So it's something that is of interest to me and I'm following up to see how we can be able to work with our young people. Yeah. We've seen IMF, World Bank, you know, coming in, ADB Bank, and giving some, some of them a grant, some of them as loans, others are loans with no interest. So 
uh, the country and not just the country but globally we are, we are experiencing um, you know um, some challenges but we are hoping that then the people who are given resources whether they are little resources the best thing is how these resources are yeah. utilized just to come in when honorable or else yeah Honorable Chege, we seem to be having a bit of a challenge with your network there, but it's interesting that you bring up the Kazim Tani pilot program because that is the question that most people are asking about. How are you going to ensure as legislators that one, the people are paid, and two, that it is sustained? All right, we seem to be having a slight challenge there with Honorable Sabina Chege. Once uh, your network stabilizes, we'll get back to you. Kindly just mute your microphone for us. We'll come back to you as soon as your network stabilizes. Honorable Moura, let me bring you in on this. If the pilot was in your area, that's in Kiambu, how did it go? How did you ensure that, that what, what were the sentiments of the youth? Were they asked to join in in a clean, clear way? Was there a complaint? And how then will you ensure that they actually paid for their work? Yeah. <laughs> actually, my brother, you know, I, did, I have not seen anybody being given that kind of uh, job. And that does not mean that it's not happening. It would be unfair to say that. But it clearly, uh, uh, it, it is an example of showing that uh, this program is not well coordinated. And you see that sometimes when you see people working, you don't know whether they are working for government by the way, this can be a very major corruption you know, issue. The president, the president may mean well, but in the same way we had challenges of who was actually listed to receive the COVID-19 you know, cash transfer, I am yet to see any young person from my locality telling me they are in this program. Uh, for example, we don't know how many are per ward, per constituency, per, you know, you know, all of those. Those statistics are not, they are very obscure. And you know, uh, when you are running an administration like some form of prefecture, uh, which is insular to accountability, then that is what you get, you know, because then you don't really know, uh, the, the right hand uh, doesn't know what the left hand is, is doing. And especially there has been some kind of, uh, uh, you know, deliberate effort to hush politicians and, uh, you know, people's representatives from, uh, from actually the COVID-19. It, it has been run off with the governors. Of course, Sabina and I and others have done a lot of work in distributing food. The need is very strong on the ground. But then in terms of this government programming, we've not really been involved as much by the, the executive arm. So it is, not, it is not very easy to say how the young people are benefiting and how it is, I, that doesn't mean that it has not happened, but if it, were, it had an impact, it would have of course reached me. So is there a system that you're going to do to ensure that the, you are the oversight, you're the legislator, we are looking to you to ensure that the government does the right thing and you seem to be just as concerned as the rest of us who are citizens. How are you going to ensure then that everything works for the good of the people. Because Rosa Wangu here, who's joining us online, says government has failed to create a conducive environment for businesses to prosper, and especially for the youth, including a punitive tax regime. And they've also failed to create adequate employment or entrepreneurship opportunities for the youth. The pandemic has just made a bad situation even worse. So how sure are we that the stimulus package will work for the youth? Kazim Dani will not fit all the one million plus who are now unemployed on the Moura. Honorable Moura is still with us. Trevor, you can hear me now? Yes, yes, you're back. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, yeah, so I was saying that, um, you see, we don't even have the Auditor General, you know, and that, yeah. that means that, uh, you know, Parliament always, and this is something we've been trying to move away from, uh, acting like morticians, you know, who come to diagnose what made the patient to die, what killed the patient. Uh, so these elements of accountability, especially during crisis, uh, are a challenge. But we have a very good example uh, in New Zealand, where actually an official committee was formed, which was led by the opposition. But now, Trevor, with the handshake, who is in government and who is not in government? You see, if, if, if we had a proper opposition, we would have had divergent voices so that then those of us who uh, are maybe chairing committees would be the ones bringing government position, but them, of course, speaking on the other side of the aisle. But then that is not happening. So we are, I, I have actually asked a question 
about the use of COVID-19 funds in the Senate. I'm yet to receive uh, feedback uh, from what was presented in the National Assembly. And that tells you that uh, people kind of, as of now, they are looking the other way because of the fears of this crisis. And that is how you find the billions having been looted and you make overnight billionaires and millionaires. So this, this is a challenge. And, and it's not just uh, us complaining. It is just uh, the efficacy uh, of uh, the three arms of government working in tandem as during crisis when some of this uh, kind of uh, you know severe application of the law is is a kind of suspended is is is, is, is something for concern other than of course the police brutality to ensure the curfew so uh, i mean I, I think we need to see more of action but because the implementation is being done through the prefecture which is a provincial administration we have to see yeah. some level of accountability yeah all right let me bring in honorable sabina chege if she's back with us and marvin yes. Wamu, marvin wamukota is asking that the economic cycle that we are in as a country is very interesting. And given the nature of our, economic, of our economy, we can only stretch it a little due to the inelasticity. The inclusion of the stimulus packet to the budget estimates is good, but all this will only be as good as the implementation plan that will be laid out. The impact will only be realized if the sectors in charge takes up their role as legislators how are you going to ensure that at the end of this all, we don't come up with scandals that are worth trillions? Because from where I'm hearing this conversation coming through, there's no Auditor General, like Honorable Moura has just mentioned. There's a lot of funds coming into the country, different avenues it's heading out to. Kazim Tani, you're the legislators representing your people. You don't seem to know how it's going to play out. And you're the people that have been elected to represent the people, Honorable Sabina. Yes, you see, uh, Trevor, what happens with um, the executive when such a program came and they, they, they chose to use the provincial administration when we have uh, the members of parliament, you know, we have people who deal with uh, one inch every day. We have like the CDF uh, structures where you're able to reach to the, you know, the person in the village. So it was not clear. It was a government uh, policy that came up and then the Kazim Tani was rolled out, but there was no clear explanation on how it was to be done. From where I, I stand and I'm disappointed to hear more is in the Kembu County, I know that was a pilot and that was, uh, the counties were, were supposed to advise us on what worked and what didn't work, so that as we prepare for our own counties, then we know what to be done. But where the role come in, uh, the role of a member of parliament or a legislature, because our, our role is not just to allocate these finances, but also to oversight. Uh, on the implementation. So I'm, I'm very sure by next week, personally, I'll be asking a question in Parliament so that the specific committee, whether it's the one on labor and social or interior, I don't know who is in charge of that program, so they can be able to explain to the members of, of Parliament and actually to the public, even to many millions of our youths who are wondering how would I be among the 100,000. Yes, we cannot be able to cover everybody, but we want to sure that the little that has been given to reach to the people who are intended to benefit. And of course, we start with the most vulnerable. And, and, and so my role as a chair, even when it comes to what has been allocated in health, there have been a lot of finances that have been allocated to health. It's just to do a follow-up. Remember there was that issue of tea and coffee um, the, the, tea, the snacks, uh, the, the four million, and the, we got a clear explanation of what was planned by the World Bank and what yeah. the ministry had actually utilized. So we are following up and keenly following up to make sure that we do not lose, we don't have enough, but we do not want to lose any single cent. And so it's just calling up the government officials who are in charge to make sure that the money goes to the intended purpose. Yeah. Ms. Karen Bet, let me bring you in on this conversation. You've been listening to the legislators. What are your preliminary points on this Kazim Tani initiative? Because this is what most people are asking about online. Thanks, uh, Trevor. I think the feedback uh, from the two legislators actually resonates with uh, the key comments we got at the beginning of, uh, of the webinar in terms of um, who benefits first how do they benefit and then how do you uh, measure accountability and i think when i look at it from those three uh, elements who benefits how who how do you know which youth needs that uh, needs to benefit from that job if the if we're going to register at the chief's office and i know um kenya has a history of doing everything at the chief when it gets this up uh, like the village uh, location level uh, we rely on the chief 
for registering youths, for giving out bursaries, for issuing death uh, registrations, you know, that kind of thing. But is it sustainable really to rely on one institution with so many uh, demands? The risk is it will not be sustainable. So the chief will use a pen and paper, he'll register youths on a notebook. How is that sustainable if it's not uh, using institutions and systems that are actually building a register of youths who benefited? It would be unfair to have one youth benefiting from uh, the program month on, month on, and there's another youth who has not even got himself to, to you know, to his name written in the chief's, in the chief's notebook, uh, if you see what I mean. So that's, that's the beginning of the problem, that we don't have good system that is actually keeping a list and registering and recruiting the youths. The second one then is how are we paying them? If we're paying them through, through money transfer, yes, that's efficient, that's good. And we're also uh, building the system, that's good. But is everyone getting uh, his, his um, what he deserves or what she deserves? Are there uh, fictitious uh, recipients? And again, it goes back to the register and uh, unique identification and things like that. So that's the second layer. And I think the last one is just uh, how is it changing lives and how is it actually sustainable? And I think we started uh, this conversation earlier when we said um, the Kazi, uh, the, the Vijana project is, a, it's a project, it is not a system. And so once the six months is over, it's the end of the project. So what happens to the youth after six months? Yes, we'll have sort of cushioned the economy, we will have uh, stimulated the economy. Will we have changed lives in six months? Will we have uh, gotten people out of poverty in six months? I don't think so. And again, it goes back to the, it's, it's, a, it's a stimulus package, yes, it's a band aid. But you know, even me, myself, I wouldn't enjoy doing manual jobs for one year. I mean, I want to upgrade to an office job. I want to assist the chief <laughs> to the register, that kind of thing. So how do we transition out of projects into systems? And I think that's where, again, it starts from the beginning. If you don't get it right at the beginning, then it's going to affect the entire system and the entire purpose. But of course, I'm not saying it's a bad initiative. I mean, it's going to push on uh, many youths who've been uh, unemployed, but there, there are some lessons we can take forward. Thanks. Dr. Rugo, what, what do you make of this conversation? Before the legislators joined in, and now you can hear them also speaking about this Kazim Tan initiative, there seems to be no one who's directly responsible for it. There seems to be no accountability because the legislators themselves are saying they don't know if the youth have been incorporated into it. They don't know whether they're working for government or not. How can we streamline this so that the youth actually benefit from it? Uh, th thanks, Trevor. And it's uh, it's nice to to, uh, to see to see my my old comrade uh, and friend Maura, and, and of course to see Honorable uh, Chege uh, Sabina. My my take is that uh, we we seem to be making one step forward with our institutional strengthening and two steps back. Now, part of the reason why we established a devolved system of government is because we wanted a government that is close to the people. Uh, so that you don't have to start coordinating Kazi uh, 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 in Mombasa from Nairobi, you know, uh, even Kiambu from Nairobi, even Nairobi, you know, uh, basically from the national government level. M my concern has been that there, there's seemingly a very limited, if any, coordination between the national government and the county government actors, and not to say that the latter are any better. Uh, but, but the essence of devolution, uh, and, and I'm a strong, uh, staunch supporter of a devolved system of government, is that then you have a government that is close to the people and people can be able to engage that government uh, to, 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 to be able. So, so we wouldn't be having the kind of conversation we are having about Kazim Tani, where we know very well that these are resources that have been committed to the Kiambu County government, uh, to Mombasa County government, to Mandera County government and the like. Uh, and therefore, the youth are basically questioning the creation of opportunities at that level. The second, uh, assuming that were correct and that had been fixed uh, uh, from an accountability perspective, the, the, the second concern is how much, how much exactly are we talking about of this Kazi uh, Kazim Tani versus the number of youths that are unemployed? You know, because, because as, I, as I explained earlier, the essence of an economic uh, stimulus program, because you cannot send, I mean, if, if all government wanted to do is to, to stimulate the economy, you know, without engaging, it would basically send everybody an M-Pesa, uh, 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 you know, uh, cash transfer, 
uh, and then there will be no need to engage in an economic. But because you have limited resources, then you want to invest the limited resources in the space where you are going to get uh, the highest return on investment and impact, uh, particularly in putting money in the pockets of, uh, of families and households and individuals. And therefore, but when you compare, the target I think is about 200,000 youths, uh, mostly in urban areas. Uh, of course, there are other programs that one could argue that are also targeting them, like the ones in manufacturing, in agriculture, uh, and, the, and, and, and the like. But the target is still very small compared to the number of people who are in need. Now, because you cannot create an economic stimulus program, you know, like the US of $2 trillion uh, uh, dollars, uh, uh, given our, our limited fiscal space, then you have to go for an option that opens the economy by private sector actors. Uh, and then, and therefore you create multiple avenues of employment so that not everybody is, is looking for a chance to be within the Kazim Tani uh, uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of framework. So that coordination for me uh, is missing. I, I mean, I sympathize with my good friends uh, uh, in parliament, uh, but I still think there's still a role and a big one uh, uh, for them uh, to push and ask these questions because uh, it's sad as you rightly noted, uh, for us to be asking the same questions uh, while seated on extreme uh, ends of the table. Yeah. Lynette, Lynette now wants to jump in and give a few remarks on this issue, Lynette. What are your thoughts on this? Just unmute your microphone, please, Lynette. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. I do yes. agree with Dr. Abraham in the sense that, yes, indeed, these uh, funds that we want to channel down to the youth that it's, it may not be adequate or for them, they, they seem to look at it as a short-term uh, revenue generating activity. But from my perspective, I see it as not only uh, a revenue generating activity, but this can also give them some seed money that they can use to plug in or plow into these um, ventures that they're saying they don't have money to do, to, to start up. And once they put this money into these uh, private, uh, uh, sorry, these ventures that they have in mind that they think the government is not funding, then they can bring up the idea, they can do the economic analysis, they can come to, uh, they can go to the various uh, county officers and ask for maybe a loan or even a bank to ask for a loan after they have come up with this business idea that they have put in place using the seed money that they have gotten yeah. from the yeah. salary that they can be paid, yeah. Okay, let me bring in Honorable Moura on this. Honorable Moura, I don't know whether you're still with us there. there seems to be I'm here, I'm here, yes. Yes, there's a question yeah. here from Claire Neondo, mm -hmm. who says, if there is no Auditor General, how is accountability and transparency being embraced in the various projects being rolled out? Your guess is, is as good as, as, as mine, I mean, Leah, because uh, I mean, if there is no, you know, somebody superintending over how these monies are being used, you can only rely on internal audit. And one of the things that we've discovered in the Senate, most counties don't have internal audit. You almost get the feeling like it is, it is beneficial for some people that they have COVID-19 in their counties. You saw Governor Mutua putting an A-frame uh, in a stadium and some tuft and calling it a hospital with the normal hospital beds. I mean, this kind of reckless wanton spend expenditure, and actually he was, he was asking to borrow 900 million shillings for COVID-19. So, so really it is tough. And uh, by the way, uh, Trevor, you know, there are elements of accountability. When you look at uh, the three arms of government, you may want to imagine that um, that is sufficient, but look at All right, we seem to have lost uh, Honorable Isaac Maura there as he's reconnecting. Honorable Sabina Chege, are you still there with us? We are still continuing. Yes, I am. This, yes, on this conversation of Kazim Tani now, and the main concern that people have is then, as legislators, what steps are you then taking to ensure that the Kenyan is appropriately represented and the national government is held to account? Because you seem to be lamenting just like the rest of us. Let me know. You see, you, you, you can't um, really, I can't purport to answer on behalf of the government because uh, we have very you know, distinct roles. And that is why we were asking those questions. This is a program that was announced by his residency, the president. Then we got the list of the counties that they were doing the pilot. And so 
for me, and I, and I said this uh, by next week, actually this does, it. I'll be asking a question in Parliament to find out how the pilot has gone. And so the plan and the role of plan for the other, the rest of the 47 counties, with, the, with my experience with the, when we were doing the, the UHC and we did the pilots at the four counties, um, then later now we are rolling out UHC in the other 47 counties. And the four counties were meant to, for us to learn and see how the best way forward. And that is the same um, way I thought this cousin turn would happen. But having said that, I would also want to say we have created also other opportunities apart from only the 100,000 the government or 200,000 the government is targeting on cousin turn. Like in health, we have really have done a lot of employment. I would just want to single out a hospital, a Kenyatta University Hospital. A Kenyatta Hospital, there's one billion shillings that was also given for employment by Ministry of Health. And counties were actually asked to also hire and the money was provided by the national government. But you find that, that uh, even today, there are some counties that have not hired. And so it is resorting now for the national government almost to force them to hire. And you'd wonder if um, the counties then have been given money, why would you not hire people? And those are other opportunities. So we, with the whole of this COVID um, pandemic, and especially in healthcare, there are many opportunities that have, have come up for employment. And number two, we have also seen that the, the government has also reduced on the rates um, for in the banks from the central bank. So that, that means then the business people can be able to easily access to, to the finances. And so there are several interventions, apart from Kazim Tani, that seem to directly, you know, benefit the youth. These employment opportunities, the youth will also benefit when it comes to the... The, the funding from uh, you know the central bank supporting our banks that means then if there's somebody who had a job then they'll have another opportunity again to employ our people i had somebody asking you know is the 200,000 target enough no it's not enough but there are other interventions and if they are properly coordinated then we can see very good results but the problem i think we have within ourselves within the government is communication because communication is key if i am the people's representative i will not have the information then what does it tell me about the, people, the person I represent, who is on the ground, or the Wanjiko? So communication is key, and that's what we'll be, uh, we'll be requesting to get from, um, from the government, so that we're able yeah. to tell our young people where the opportunities are. And I'm very sure there have been the issue of PPEs, the, the local manufacturers have been supported so that they can be able to now start doing local manufacturing. And that means then our young people will still get more opportunities in the yeah. EPZ where... Um, the government is now encouraging even for this mask and everything to be done locally. And so with that, then more opportunities will come in. But we need to properly coordinate. We, we did the census. We know the numbers. We know where our young people are. COVID has even made it worse than a time for census because a person who used to go, a person yeah. would go to, get to become back. I'm actually, um, to this afternoon, we tabled um, uh, another a, a question with the Honorable Fokamukonji because a lot of young people are also preferring to do the Mutumba business. Then the, the Ministry of Trade just decided to ban Mutumba in the pretense that they are trying to prevent COVID. And COVID cannot be transferred, you know, through the, those clothes, the secondhand clothes. We had many of our young people who are even graduates who go to be combined by the end of the day, they go home with a thousand. Others will just go to carry those, um, you know, the, the bills and everything, and they'll go home with 500 or 1,000 shillings. That means by the end of the month, the person is making around 30,000. If you close that, that business, that means then 10,000, actually 10,000 people in Kenya have lost businesses. Because from Gikomba, then it rolls out to the rest of the country. And so we yeah. need also to be cautious with the government and the law lawmakers on the decisions that we make, because they also have an impact and a huge impact to a lot of yeah. families in this country. Honorable Maura, the, the young people who tuned in people now tuned in. online and they're listening to this conversation, what guarantees do they have that their interests are still safeguarded by the legislators like yourselves? Just unmute your microphone, please, Honorable Maura. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much because I... Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much because um, I am I am very um, uh, you know looking at the elements of uh, accountable government, and and I think that uh, it is very difficult for uh, people to look at things just from uh, a point of um, the three arms of government. Uh, if you look at it down, uh, further, you will realize that uh, you need to you need to have the the military, uh, you need to have the executive, you need to have the legislature. Uh, representation. Then you have accountable elections, intelligence, 
And then we have added something called the, the media also, but also there's a third arm called, uh, there's an extra arm called the independent and consumer offices. Now, these are required for any accountability to make sense. And Trevor, they are not very well developed and very well established in the counties. And also the, the government design, I mean, this is something that people don't like to talk about. If you see the contestation between the, the executive and the judiciary, it's because of the way we designed our new constitution. There is a problem. If you look at the Article 171 on the JSC, if you look at even the powers, how we were creating checks and balances. So what am I trying to say? That government design is made to be insular to the issues of the common one and the youth for that matter. It is very bourgeoisie. It is for the middling classes who may not fully understand uh, the challenges of the people on the ground. And that then was actually augmented by having ministers who are technocrats. Now, Sabina and I here cannot answer questions on behalf of the executive, but if we had the previous system of a, of, of parliamentary system kind of, then ministers would be in parliament. But see now, we also ask the same questions. In fact, in the National Assembly, it used to be that uh, the chairman would behave as if he's answering for government and yet he has no answers, even if he goes to get the answers from government. So we need to rethink about our, 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 our government design so that it's pro people, especially for this kind of jurisdiction. You know, we need people who are answerable, people who are connected with the masses so that they can bring, because if then we were the ones in charge, we would be speaking more volubly. But then when you have an elected All right, we seem to be having another challenge there with Honorable Isaac Moura. Who yeah, then relies yes, on, hear me now? You, can can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, yes, yeah. go ahead. So, so you, when you have a president relying on the prefecture to do his yeah. work, then it becomes a very difficult uh, thing, even for the youth, because they think Mitumba is just some form of nonsense somewhere. They, they see this uh, shady kiosk on the side and think it's some rubbish. But when you are with the people, you understand why they have actually been there, and you would want to lift their, 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 themselves from poverty. All right. And now we only have about 15 minutes. I want to give you each a chance for closing remarks very briefly and focus mostly on how do we spur the economic growth post-COVID-19. Nobody knows how that looks like, but we can pontificate on how best to go about it, how to ensure that the ship remains afloat as we go towards the next years and to be living beyond COVID-19. Dr. Abram, I'll start with you. What, what are just your closing remarks very briefly on that? How do we ensure the ship remains afloat and we get to the other side. Good, good. Uh, th th thanks, Trevor. And I really have uh, uh, learned a lot from this conversation. Mm, in my thinking, uh, we have uh, two uh, uh, primary uh, and core tasks around this time. And when I say we basically as a country and our government needs to uh, play this role. One is, as I say, that we need to ensure that there is cash available for private actors who basically spark uh, economic activity. Government cannot purport to be the one that basically drives the economy. That is not possible. So that's for me, I think is a big piece. Um, so as much money as can be, uh, you know, um, restructured, including the discussions around debt moratorium, that 905 billion, I still think there is space to have a conversation and have some, some of that money going uh, to assure that there is money for uh, economic activity, especially around the private sector. I think it's also a time to really actually save up. You know, yeah. I don't think the hard, the hard parts of the effects of COVID uh, have come yet. I think they will be felt more in 2021. Uh, okay. because, because that's a time now we will basically experience uh, the, missed, uh, the missed summer, summer tr travels uh, the Christmas festivities and everything that goes with that. So I think yeah. it's time to basically spend very cautiously right now because I feel like there's going to be coming a year that, uh, you know, the, 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 the global economy will, will recede. There's going to be slightly harder times and therefore we shouldn't continue almost on an expansionary budget as though yeah. uh, the hard times are behind, are behind us. So, so I, I see that. Um, and lastly, I am expecting a, a, a supplementary budget not sooner than the end of next month, uh, which will have more realistic numbers uh, than we currently okay. have. Thanks. All right. Ms. Karen Bet, your final thoughts on this? How do we keep the ship afloat as we go to the other side, whatever the other side looks like post-COVID-19? Yeah. Yes, and just not to repeat uh, what uh, Rugo has mentioned, I think I look at this actually in like 
five small packets. Uh, I think the legislations, uh, just let's think about the proper legislations to push on us. You know, um, I'm, I'm all about data, so uh, data protection, data sharing, those kinds of systems. And um, I think what has come up also in this conversation is around accountability. And right now, uh, the situation we're in is we cannot have barazas or public participation face-to-face. Uh, -face. So how do we bring in innovative mechanisms for accountability? How do we continue keeping ourselves and also our leaders engaged? And I think it's good that in this COVID times, it's easier to get a member of parliament uh, to be in a Zoom meeting and things like that. So how do we capitalize on those gains? And then let's think about, um, and I think it links, this links also to uh, innovation on accountabilities. Let's think about data beyond what government collects. So um, civil society collect a lot of data. They are fast, they are quick, and they are able to you know, turn around data quickly. How can we use the data that civil society collects uh, just to keep our, keep our uh, government uh, to check and, uh, and, and accountable? So how do we continuously build systems and use data for decision making? And um, the second to last is just, um, well, the investments we're making now for COVID response is not a rehearsal. It's the reality we're living in. So, and it's and it should help us to uh, be cushioned for the next uh, shocks uh, whenever they come. So, how do we ensure that we're building systems and we're not just project projectizing our interventions? So, let's build back for better. And as Abraham said, it's it's the 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 worst is yet to come. So how do we protect ourselves and build systems uh, and rather than projects? Lastly, uh, and this touches on financing because um, this conversation today was really about money. And just the reality is now more than ever, we need to realize that we are on our own as a country. We need to rely on ourselves, uh, less on donors, more on ourselves. So how do we continue to um, utilize the scarce resources that we have to make the wisest decisions uh, for people and and to make sure that uh, the hardest the ones who are left behind or the ones who are hardest hit are the ones who we intervene uh, at, we make interventions to them uh, much faster thank you all right let's bring in lynette lynette what are your thoughts on this just unmute your microphone please I do agree with Karen and I, I'd like to add on to what she has said. I do agree that we should put, uh, currently we should put mechanisms and uh, mechanisms to actually ensure that there's transparency and accountability, even with the minimal resources that has been allocated to at least ensure that the economy tries to bounce back. We, even with the economic uh, stimulus package, at least ensure there's transparency so that uh, the, the people in the uh, country can have confidence in, uh, in the government as well. And we should also put in place mechanisms that will cushion the country against other epidemics or shocks that will come in future. All right. Thank you. Honorable Isaac Moura, what are your final comments on this? How do we ensure that the economic growth is maintained or even spurred further post COVID-19? And also how do we keep the ship afloat going forward? Honorable Moore, if you're still there with us, just kindly unmute your microphone. Honorable Moura, I think we don't seem to have him close by. Honorable Sabina Shege, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. What are your closing remarks on this? What should the government do to spur economic growth going forward and as we keep the ship stable towards yes. post-COVID-19, whatever that looks like? I think for me, I have taken the issue of this pandemic as a positive one because it has, um, it's a high time that we start thinking differently as a nation. We stop relying on other people and we start, you know, being self-sufficient um, in many things that we do. I, I don't know, I don't see why we need to import so many things and we need to really put money to where, especially on our SMEs. I know the big boys might survive, but we need to really put a lot of money as a government and rethink on how we can even be able to cushion these uh, business people. Uh, we, we cannot miss the point um, on the digital ICT. Well, I didn't know Zoom, you know, <laughs> I didn't know about Zoom at all until there was COVID and now everybody's on Zoom. So which are these opportunities that we can be able to pick uh, from the experience of this pandemic? We have to stop doing things as usual and normal. So we need to look at the, maybe the situation, the, the lockdown might still continue, but then how can we make money? How can we be able so to move 
you know, by doing things differently. I think that's a point that we need to look at. The issue of Auditor General has been brought up here, that we don't have an Auditor General for such a long time. But it doesn't mean that that office is empty. There are still people who are doing um, the audits. They are, they, are, they are going on. The only problem is that we cannot have the signed copy. Then that means that we need to amend our law because the law does not provide for even a Deputy Auditor General to sign. So those are some of the lessons that we need to know ourselves as the lawmakers. Then how can we change that if we do not have an auditor general and the process might take long, then who can sign on behalf? Because those offices are people who are being paid, who are working. We had our, our fund being audited a few, I think, weeks ago. But then, if then we don't have somebody to sign, is it, does it mean that with the, we are with the law that only one person can sign? Then we need to change it. And, and, I, and I think we now have to look at the opportunity, the private sector, let's up both them and especially SMEs, as I've said, those, these are the engines. They're the ones who move the economy of this nation. We have concentrated so much on the government being the sole provider for Kenyans. You know, everybody wants to do business with the, with the government, and then the government doesn't pay them. There are many pending bills. But the government needs to provide an opportunity for the, you know, the, the, the private sector also to be able to sustain the economy of this nation. And I think once we have that conversation, and not a selfish one, so that we also consider the, 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 the small people, the small um, the SMEs, so that we, uh, we can be able to support them. So for me, finally, is accountability. We, we must, as Kenyans, you know, be true to ourselves. And we cannot ignore accountability. Whether there's an auditor general or not, these are Kenyan taxpayers' money. We cannot sit and watch people loot, you know, and especially at this time when we are trying to share the little we had. I think you saw the cabinet secretary, treasury, you know, at pain trying to explain how we are going to sustain the economy. Um, we cannot continue borrowing. We have so much money as a nation. Can we be able to work with the little that we have? Can we also avoid, you know, and call for borrowing? Some of the things, some of the projects have become white elephant projects that we asked for so much money and we didn't need that money. We actually didn't need those projects. It's a high time also the government does a different, and I've had somebody saying, yes, we might have a, a more realistic, you know, um, budget where we might even have to do a supplementary budget, where we ask ourselves, what is our priority? Do we need to build roads? Do we need water? Do we need electricity? What is our priority? What can be a quick start? What can jumpstart the economy? But we cannot continue budgeting, you know, the same way government does, um, year in after you're adding this percentage and you don't even change even the columns. Sometimes even some projects that do not exist, you still see them existing in, in, in those presentations. The ministers yeah. might wake up, must, they must wake up, and they, they, they must, even the PFs, they must now give Kenyans a, a, a prioritized budget with what is urgent. What is not urgent, we get rid of it. All right. Thank you so much for making time. Gusale here on Twitter says, if Kenya depends on foreign tourists to thrive, yet the COVID-19 has affected their frequency of coming, should Kenya prioritize in the industry of agriculture or to ensure, to ensure that there's food security there? Emmanuel Sore also says that I think there is duplication of roles. We have Kazim Tan in Nairobi, of which I see youths do garbage collection, ETC. Then we also have Nairobi Metropolitan Services, which does the same job of garbage collection. All have been allocated monies to do the same job. When did census and Uduma number, why can't we just link up this data and information and do the cash transfers using that same data? We have James Njau who says, I'm concerned that months in the president has failed to appoint an auditor general. This is the lowest mark of accountability in governance. How could the parliament save this situation? That is from James. Honorable Sabina Shagi, I don't know whether you can respond to that real quick. We only have a few minutes to close this. How can parliament respond to this situation where we don't have an auditor general? Um, we need to amend the law. As I've said, we need to finally amend the law so we don't just rely on one signature. Um, there must have been a reason why they say it's only the auditor general who can sign. But if in, in case of what we have gone through now, we must, as, as a nation, amend the law. Because, right. as I said, the auditor general office is an institution. It's not an individual person. So when you're missing one person, it then doesn't mean that we cannot now hold the government to accountable. That is unacceptable right. and we must amend the law. All right. Honorable Isaac Moura, you just came in the nick of time. We're just about to close this, but I'll give you a minute to give closing remarks going forward. How do we keep the ship afloat as we cross over to the post-COVID-19, whatever that looks like, very briefly, because we're running out of time. Thank you, Trevor. It's just this internet is unreliable. But I want to say, let's just, uh, you know, uh, reduce our appetite for stealing and uh, realize that uh, we were vulnerable. And uh, when the COVID-19 has, uh, has, has made us even more vulnerable. Reduce yeah. expenditure in government. I am calling for austerity measures. 
I am calling for new innovation so that we actually fund ideas, not brick and mortar, so that we can spur our economy. I'm calling for us to look at the counties and their potential, like the high Grand Falls of Kitui to give us 700 megawatts so that we can spur the economy, how to look at new nuclear energy and things like those to spur, because we have a silver lining in this kind of COVID-19. And of course, just to say that we should not be, you know, uh, the, uh, feeling down and uh, feeling like we can't rise again. We have the opportunity to rise again and to make Africa great. I believe we All can right. because right now, Trevor, we are the third largest economy in, in sub-Saharan Africa after Nigeria and South Africa. We can rise to the first if we continue to be resident and if we use our money well. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for making time this evening and engaging us on the COVID-19 and the economy spotlight on the stimulus package. Dr. Abram Rugo, Kenya Country Manager, International Budget Partnerships. Asante Sana for making time. Ms. Lynette Nyangweso, Economist and Research Analyst at the National Treasury. Thank you so much. Ms. Karen Rono, Bet Policy Officer, Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. Asante Sana for making time. Honorable Sabina Shege, Chairperson, Health Committee, National Assembly. Thanks for making time. And Honorable Isaac Maura, Senator and also Acting Chair, Senate Committee and Budget. COVID budget and finance. Thank you so much for making time for us this evening and engaging on this conversation. And thank you online and offline, everybody who sent in messages and texts and concerns online. We appreciate your contribution on this. And now I'll toss it back to Franklin Mukwanja, who's Executive Director, Multi Party Center for Multi Party Democracy, for a vote of thanks and to close the conversation. Franklin. Thank you very much, Trevor, for the wonderful moderation of this discussion. It's uh, quite clear. Uh, from what we've heard from the experts, from the legislators, that uh, the impact of COVID-19 is uh, not yet fully with us. Um, but when it occurs, it will really occur less on, from health-related uh, issues than the economic disruption, uh, than the economic uh, shock, and the government response that we are getting. And, and that requires a lot of uh, high accountability measures uh, to be put in place uh, that uh, the legislatures have to uh, to stand up to do their work. They have to bring in the other independent offices that uh, Honorable Isaac Maura mentioned. Uh, the civil society, the media uh, have to do their, their bit to ensure that uh, whatever plans, whatever responses that the government is coming with uh, are properly ap applied. The general, uh, you know, uh, questions from the audience, uh, looking at the challenges around uh, raising revenue. Um, Dr. Abraham Ruko challenging uh, how can we be able to expand or you know, cast the net wider and those shrinking opportunities, how we are applying this revenue and, and how we'll be able to get it right in terms of uh, where we are putting money to, to get sufficient returns. The challenge of coordinating between the two levels of government, uh, those are issues that we really need to move the conversation forward. And of course, the elephant in the room, um, the high debt that we have uh, got ourselves into, the challenges of government competing for, you know, a capital in the local market with, with, with the common people and how does then the SME uh, sector thrive. And, and of course, uh, how do we need a moratorium to release some resources to get us out of these uh, challenges? I think this is a conversation. And I want to thank the panelists very much and uh, Trevor, you for moderation and the audience uh, for re remaining with us throughout this conversation. That demonstrates one thing, that Kenyans are really interested in meaningful dialogue, conversations that really contribute uh, to, to, to their bottom line in terms of uh, getting the right information to act appropriately. And I want, I can't thank you much on behalf of the chair, the Center for Multiparty Democracy and uh, our partners. I want to thank you for sparing time to engage this conversation. Please uh, have a good evening, both participants and the panelists. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Have a blessed evening. Get something warm, stay safe. Dr. Ruga has already gotten his jumper there, so we should do the same. <laughs> Have a good one, okay. people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. What? Oh, Harry. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.